everyone, this is Air, and welcome to the 47th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Elizabeth Ann Ma Duncan, who was the fourth woman to be executed by method of the gas chamber at California's San Quentin Prison. Elizabeth Ann Ma Duncan was born in the year 1904. There is not much on her early life, but throughout her life she was used to lying, cheating, and stealing. Initially, she had claimed to have married 11 times, but the total number of men she married was closer to 20. Elizabeth went on record and said that she was afraid to count all of them because they did not mean that much to her. The reason they did not mean that much to her was because instead of marrying for love, she married for her own personal financial gain. She told these men that she needed to quickly find a husband so that she could inherit a large sum of money. She promised these men large cuts of the fortune, but instead she would live off of them, take whatever they had, and vanish to a new location. All of the marriages were illegal as well because she never bothered to divorce or communicate with these men when it was time to leave. She spent a lot of her time traveling, but eventually settled in San Francisco, California and became a madam of a brothel. She also claimed to have one son by the name of Frank and one daughter by the name of Patricia who passed away at the age of 15 in Long Beach, California due to a spontaneous brain hemorrhage. In actuality, she had four more children she did not take care of and claimed that Frank was her favorite. Elizabeth and her son Frank had an inseparable bond that soon turned incestuous and obsessive. Despite his mother's controlling behavior and always being by his side, Many said that he was a very intelligent man and well-adjusted in society. In 1956, 52-year-old Elizabeth and her 27-year-old son Frank moved into an apartment together in Santa Barbara, California. Frank began his career as a lawyer and having experienced anxiety from separating from her son, Elizabeth would spend the whole day at the courthouse going from one courtroom to another to watch Frank at work. If he ever won a case, she was sitting behind him cheering him on. Some of Frank's friends and colleagues noticed the intense hovering and they suggested that Frank stand up to his mother and start on a new path to find love and his own place. In 1957, a year after moving into their new apartment together, Frank mustered up enough strength to stand up to his mother and he kicked her out of their shared apartment. Elizabeth had a nervous breakdown and was anxious at the thought of not being able to spend every minute with Frank. Scared that Frank would be okay with them being apart, Elizabeth decided to take a large amount of pills and overdosed. Although she survived, she was taken to a local hospital and put in a coma. She did, however, prevail at getting the attention she wanted from her son. Frank was right by her side when she woke up from her coma and spent as much time as he could at the hospital. Also frequenting Elizabeth's hospital room was a 29-year-old nurse by the name of Olga. Frank grew a liking to Olga, and the two flirted and spent as much time together as Frank did with his mother. Elizabeth saw the spark between the two, so for the next three months, she called Olga's home every single day, expressing that she wanted her to stop seeing her son and would kill her if she didn't. On one specific phone call, Olga told Elizabeth that she and Frank were going to be married, and she replied by saying, You'll never marry my son. I'll kill you first. Not taking her threat seriously, Olga agreed to marry Frank and they had a secret ceremony on June 20th, 1958. While married to Olga, Frank was still living with Elizabeth and would just visit Olga at her apartment, so Elizabeth initially had no clue her son was married. When Elizabeth eventually found out, she followed Frank when he went to visit Olga and knocked on their door demanding Frank to leave with her. Frank gave in and left with his mother, but within the next few days, Olga was able to move into a new apartment, and Frank finally moved in with her and did not disclose the new location with his mother. Elizabeth was hurt by Frank's betrayal, and her anger went over the top when she found out Olga was pregnant. Elizabeth went to her longtime friend, Barbara Reed, and offered her $1,500 to help her kill Olga. She told Barbara that Frank was not the real father, and Olga was trying to trap her son. Although Barbara did not go to the police, she did go to Frank and let him know everything his mother said. Scared of his mother's threats, Frank decided to move back in with his mother, leaving his pregnant wife home alone. In early August of 1958, Elizabeth, not satisfied that Frank was back at home with her, decided to hire an ex-convict by the name of Ralph to help her get Frank and Olga's marriage annulled. They both went to court while Elizabeth pretended to be Olga and Ralph pretended to be Frank. 
While in court, Ralph, acting as the plaintiff, testified that Olga had not been living with him since they were married and that she never intended to truly marry him. The judge ruled in Frank or Ralph's favor and the annulment was granted. Still not satisfied, Elizabeth went to her other longtime friend by the name of Emma Short and asked her if she could convince Ralph to take care of Olga for her. Emma agreed to ask, but Ralph refused to do anything. The only reason Ralph later testified that he did not go to authorities was because he did not want to get locked up for the fake annulment he agreed to take part in. Elizabeth eventually found out where Olga was living and before entering the apartment complex, she made contact with the apartment manager and told him, I will kill her if it's the last thing I do. Despite hearing these words, the apartment manager allowed Elizabeth entry to Olga's place in what she claimed was an attempt to get the rest of her son's clothing. Elizabeth left empty-handed, but with a more vengeful heart. The two previous friends she propositioned to help get rid of Olga were of no help, so Elizabeth went to another friend by the name of Diane Romero. Coincidentally, Diane's husband Rudolph was one of Frank's clients, and Elizabeth told Rudolph that Frank was being blackmailed by Olga and that she needed help getting rid of the new mom-to-be. Elizabeth offered Rudolph and Diane money, so Diane went to Olga's house with the intention of scoping out her apartment. For some reason, Olga let Diane in, and Diane recognized Olga as the nurse who previously helped get Elizabeth back in good health. After the visit, Diane went to her husband, and they refused to hurt Olga. Now on to the next person. Elizabeth then went to Diane and Rudolph's roommate, Rebecca Diaz. She communicated with Rebecca that Olga was threatening her and demanding large sums of money. She then asked Rebecca if she could help her in finding someone to get rid of her, and Rebecca agreed. A few months later, Elizabeth and her friend Emma Short went to a restaurant owned by a woman by the name of Esperanza. Esperanza's husband was also a client of Frank's, and being that Elizabeth went to almost every case Frank worked on, she knew details of their case. Frank was able to get a dismissal for Esperanza's husband when he was charged with receiving stolen property. When Elizabeth spoke with Esperanza, she told her that Frank was being blackmailed by Olga and that she threatened to throw acid on Frank's face. Esperanza said that she knew some men, but wasn't sure if they would talk with her directly, so she said she would let her know. Elizabeth and Emma left the cafe, but returned the very next day because Esperanza had found two men, 21-year-old Luis Moya and 26-year-old Gus Baldonado. They all sat at the same table together, and after hearing Elizabeth out, they agreed to help her. Luis was a career criminal who was in and out of the system since the age of 11, and he was also into drugs. He had previously assaulted someone with a knife and had also attempted to escape prison while locked up, so he was no stranger to illegal activity. The terms were that the job had to be done within three to six months, and they would get $3,000 up front and $3,000 after the job was done. After agreeing on a price and time frame, they then began to plan what would actually happen. They were supposed to take Olga to Mexico and kill her there. The men expressed that they needed some extra money up front for the necessary items they needed for the crime, like weapons, gloves, and money for transportation. They then went to a pawn shop where Elizabeth was able to get $175 for some rings, and she gave the men that money. On November 17, 1958, Luis and Gus rented a car for $25 and drove to Olga's apartment complex. Gus stayed in the car while Luis made his way inside and knocked on Olga's door. When Olga answered, Luis told her that her husband was drunk and had asked him to get her so she could help. Olga believed Luis and followed him outside of the complex to their rented car. When they made it, she saw what she thought to be Frank passed out in the back seat so she opened the back seat door to assist and Luis hit her on the back of the head with a pistol. Gus, who was pretending to be Frank, pulled Olga inside and Luis hopped in the driver's seat and left Santa Barbara. Still conscious, Olga tried her best to kick and scream her way out of the vehicle. When they finally arrived at a secluded area near a beach, Gus took the pistol and knocked Olga unconscious. The hit to the head was so hard that the handle of the pistol broke. After the physical assault, he bound her with tape, and Luis continued his drive towards Mexico. During their drive, however, their rental car was giving out on them, so they stopped in Ojai, California, and dragged her body to a culvert under a road. They could no longer use the pistol that Gus had destroyed, so they both took turns trying to strangle Olga, switching when one of them got too tired. 
When they could no longer feel a pulse, they dug up a shallow grave with their bare hands and buried her body. The two men then headed back to Santa Barbara. Before returning the rental car to its owner, they tried hard to remove any bloodstains or any other evidence that would incriminate them later. The car was far gone and they told the car owner that the car had been ruined by a cigarette and they would pay for any damages. When the men finally made contact with Elizabeth, they let her know that their task was complete and they wanted the rest of their pay. Elizabeth, however, let them know that there would be no money just yet because the cops were already questioning her about Olga's disappearance. She ended up asking her son Frank for $150 to buy a typewriter, so Frank wrote her a check. Elizabeth took the check, drove to Santa Barbara to meet Luis, and gave it to him. Agreeing to accept payments from Elizabeth, the next payment he received was $10. Frank was growing weary of his mother and asked her about what she did with the check he gave her for the typewriter, and she let him know that she was being blackmailed and had to give the check to someone else. Not satisfied with her answer, Frank decided to go to police and inform them that he thought his mother was behind the disappearance of his wife, Olga. After a thorough investigation, Elizabeth, Luis, and Gus were arrested. When Luis met with investigators, he asked to speak with a spiritual advisor, and they agreed to let him speak with a Reverend Floyd Gresset. When they met, Luis dropped to his knees and told the Reverend that it was the first time in his life he had done this and had asked God to forgive him. After meeting, Reverend Floyd told investigators that he was ready to confess to God and man. They were then able to find Olga's body on December 21, 1958. A psychiatrist by the name of Dr. David Harvey said that Luis was a sociopath and was not capable of changing and would be a constant danger to society. He also said that religion is a good start towards rehabilitation, but he accepted God too recent to make any suggestions or conclusions. Trial began in 1959 in Ventura County, California, and Elizabeth was represented by her son and attorney S. Ward Sullivan, who also represented Jack Santo and Emmett Perkins, who were accomplices to a woman I featured on this channel by the name of Barbara Graham. He lost that case, so tried his best to defend Elizabeth. Elizabeth went on stand and tried to assert that Luis and Gus were hired by Esperanza because they were unhappy with the work that Frank had provided them in court. Frank went on the stand and was questioned as well. He went on record and said that he had not seen Olga in 10 days before her death. When asked about his mother and how she felt about his relationship with Olga, he replied by saying, let's just say she hindered its development. Luis took the stand and said that he knew he was guilty, but he also knew that God had forgiven him. Gus went on stand and confessed everything. There were a total of 44 witnesses and the trial lasted for four weeks. When the trial concluded, the jury took less than five hours to deliberate and came back with a guilty verdict. All three were found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. Luis and Gus were sent to prison, but not too soon after being locked up, they tried to escape by sawing through their cell with blades from a hacksaw they smuggled in. They also beat two guards into submission and held them hostage. Their plans failed when tear gas was used, which affected the guards they held hostage as well. As for Elizabeth, she tried to appeal her case for three years. She did receive a stay of execution on the grounds that the media influenced the public and the jury when it came to sentencing. Ultimately, the stay fell through and her execution was set for August 8, 1962. Within those three years, although fighting for his mom, Frank remarried and made sure to keep this new relationship hidden from his mother. Elizabeth was transferred to San Quentin Prison and asked to be sedated ahead of time, but prison officials refused. She walked into the gas chamber with no emotions and expected Frank to be there as a witness. To her surprise, Frank was not there because he was too busy trying to work on getting her another stay. Her final words ended up being, Where's Frank? I am innocent. Three hours after Elizabeth died, Luis and Gus were laughing and joking their way to the gas chamber before being strapped in side by side. When the pellets went into the chamber, Gus yelled out, It's down. I can smell it. It doesn't smell good. They all died on August 8, 1962. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Death Row Executions, and I would like to give a shout out to Coco, K.O., Kimberly, and Pedro. I appreciate your support during these trying times and thank you guys so much for becoming patrons on my Patreon. 
I think it was a good call on the psychiatrist not to go leaning on Luis just because he claimed to have found God. After he held the guards hostage on death row and tried to escape, I for sure did not believe his fake tears of remorse. Also, him laughing his way to the gas chamber to me proved that he had no feelings and just was an evil sociopath like the doctor diagnosed. I briefly touched on this on one of my community posts, but I find it shocking how many people Elizabeth had asked to kill Olga. I mean, she had no care in the world that Olga was pregnant and made no effort to try and get to know the woman who nursed her back to good health. Her hate for Olga was stronger than her love for Frank because if she truly loved him in a non-incestuous way, she would let him be happy. Have any of you ever had an overbearing mother where it took you a long time to stand up for yourself?